BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. This is Careless by Kirsty Capes. Read by me, Abby Andrews. It's the long, hot summer of 1999. Bess is 15. She grew up in a foster family after her birth mother rejected her. But recently, things have been tense at home. Bess's only comfort is her close friend, Ishal. Suddenly, Bess's life is turned upside down when 19-year-old boy literally crashes in. Bess is faced with some very adult decisions. The long and short of it is this. It's the kind of day where the heat sticks plimsolls to tarmac and I'm standing in the toilet in the Golden Grill kebab shop with a pregnancy test stuffed into my backpack. I'm waiting for my best friend, Ishal. My face watches me from the mirror. Too much eyeliner smudged around my eyes and a thin sheen of moisture coating my upper lip. When I was born, I left the womb with my umbilical cord wrapped around my neck. I think about boy what he would think if he saw me now. Sometimes, Boy drives us to Chertsey, one town over, and we climb up to the spot on St Anne's Hill with the Brickton observation deck, and we make bets about who can get down faster, and we run so hard I feel like my legs will swing out from under me and I'll break all my teeth on the ground, and he always wins because his legs are so long but we haven't done that for a while now. I unzip the front pocket of my bag and take out the long box I got from the pharmacy. I ease my denim shorts down to my knees and wait as the build-up of liquid in my bladder streams out. I hold the pregnancy test between my legs, clumsily, dousing my hand in my own hot urine as I do so. I think about my biological mother, how her waters broke in the cinema three weeks earlier than expected. She was watching The Karate Kid. I don't think about my biological dad at all. I think he was a one-night stand. She was so sure I would be a boy because a palm reader told her. After they sewed her up and took her to see me in my little transparent plastic box, she asked them where my penis was. She didn't believe I was her baby. All these stories told in therapy at the family centre to make me feel as though I knew her my whole life, to preempt any signs of sociopathic tendencies associated with early childhood trauma. The pregnancy test is positive. I wonder what on God's green earth I'm going to tell boy. When I was ten... I went through a phase of compulsively banging my head against the wall. When I was 12, I tried my first cigarette and I was so ashamed of myself that I hit myself in the face. I wonder if I hit myself in the stomach enough, this will all go away. I'm 15 years old. The test might be wrong. I sit back down on the loo, manoeuvre the second stick between my legs. I wash my hands slowly grab my bag and leave the bathroom. Ishal has just walked in and she is like, hey, all right? As she spots me coming out of the loo. Bora, the kebab shop guy, is peeling strips of meat off the skewer with a long double-handled knife. I say to Ishal, I've got no money. What, for chips? I shrug and I feel so desperate. That's cool, she says. I'll front you. I say, nah, don't worry, I was just leaving. Are you joking? I just got here, I've got money. She waves a fiver in my face, fanning me. Sorry, I say. Turn up on time, dickhead, and maybe I'll let you buy me chips. I'm trying to joke around, but Ishal notices the manic note in my voice. Wait, what's up, Bess? I can't look her in the face. I'm thinking about boy's dick poking into my back and what I'm going to tell my foster parents. I can't tell Ishal. I can't. I stare at her, 
trying to convey how serious I am without having to announce my situation to the whole of the Golden Grill. I stick my tongue out at her. Fine, she says, her eyebrows knitting together. Just go. And as I'm leaving, Ishao turns back to Bora and I hear her ask him if he's got any weed. The town where I live, Shepparton, is famous for its film studios and parakeets. My house is on the studio's estate, on the edge of town. Wherever you go on the estate, you're in the shadow of Stage H. It's a big, old, ugly warehouse with corrugated iron walls and roof. From my bedroom window, I can see the park, with two big horse chestnut trees on the green where the parakeets roost. If I climb out of the window and sit on the porch roof facing in the opposite direction, I can see the River Ash Woods, where everyone goes to fly tip and inject heroin. And then the tin houses, which are what everyone calls the prefabs from after the Second World War. Behind them are the pits, which used to be gravel pits once upon a time, but they're all filled up with water and shopping trolleys now. I've just finished Year 11. I've had my last exam. The window is open and the air is like cold milk on my skin. And it's like Ferris Bueller's day off. And I'm thinking maybe I could find Boy and see if he'll drive us to St Anne's Hill and let me put my head in his lap and pretend to sleep and he'll stroke my hair and then I'll pretend to wake up and kiss him long and hard and he'll fall in love with me again. And then I remember that I'm pregnant. I should tell someone. I can't tell Rory and Lisa. I can't tell my social worker, Henry, who is useless. No one can save you now, Bess. I wander downstairs, and Lisa is hoovering the living room. Afternoon, she says. Funny, I reply. Mum has this habit of fluttering her hand to her neck when she's nervous. Now she's saying something about keeping the house clean because she has a student she's tutoring coming over in half an hour. I'm not listening to her. I'm wondering whether Boy has been fucking someone else. Clarissa, my sister, joins us. Clarissa is ten and the sparkling, legitimate, blood-related daughter of the family. When Lisa brought her along to the Year 10 parents' evening at my school, Our Lady of the Assumption, no one could believe that with my dark hair and moony cow face and beetle eyes and her dusty blonde ringlets and brown eyes the size of UFOs, she was my sister. I'm the other child. Mum and Rory had Clarissa about a year after they fostered me. I am their first and last, so far, foster child. Rory's not too bad. He doesn't make me call him dad like Lisa does with Mum which I must admit is a big relief. I say that I'm going out. Can I come? Clarissa asks. I shake my head just as Mum says no. I traipse back upstairs to grab my bag. While I'm up there, I call Ishao from the house phone. I hear the doorbell go. Mum opens it and Hannah Barrington's voice fills up the hallway. Hannah is in the year below, half Spanish and very thin. In November last year, Ishal and I bumped into her and her sister Mary Beth on the bridge by the golf course. Mary Beth is four years older and apparently Ishal has slighted her in some way because she dragged Ish through the fence onto the 18th hole and beat the shit out of her. Mum tutors Hannah for maths, so I get to see Hannah in our dining room once a week looking for the hypotenuse. I sneak out the back door. I cycle towards the high street. Luckily for me and Ishao, there are plenty of pubs and no one bothers to ask us for ID. We spend all our spare time together. Or we used to. Before boy. It's 2.30pm. I'm on my third lager and lime. I know that look you've got on, Ishao says. I feel my cheeks warm, a little ashamed at how easily she can read me. Am I so transparent to people, or just Ish? She knows me like the back of her hand. She knows almost everything about me, and I her. We're soulmates, me and Ish. Come on, what is it? 
Is it boy? Kind of. She leans back in her seat and rips off a hangnail swiftly. She says, I should have known it would have something to do with scumbag of the year. I shrug and chew at my own fingernails. You're not pregnant, are you? Her comment is flippant, half joking. She watches me go very still and she knows that she's bang on the money. I tell her everything. The thing about Boy is it's not a love story. He doesn't belong to me anymore, except for the piece of him growing inside me. Here's how I meet him. It's summer, 1998. I've been at the manor with Ishal, our bikes lying down on the grass by the river, sharing a spliff. Now I'm on my way home. I'm on Squire's Bridge, a Victorian thing with big ornate pillars on either side. Behind me, there's a roaring sound, like an engine revving to the point of breaking. Ahead is the church of St Mary Magdalene. A silver Ford Fiesta skids past me, whipping around the corner towards the church. A thumping, prodigy bass line spills out of it as it passes and a noise between surprise and annoyance escapes me as the car narrowly misses knocking me off my bike. I watch it happen like it's all in slow motion. The car careers from one side to the other, the exhaust bouncing off the road, the tyres slipping across tarmac, leaving scorch marks and the smell of burning rubber. It knocks itself up the curb and slams into the low brown brick wall at the perimeter of the church. The sound of the brickwork splitting and crumbling under the impact of the car is deafening. Then, after it comes to a stop, the car hisses loudly as the wreck smokes in a pile of rubble where the wall used to be. The only thing I can think is that the whole thing would look incredible on film, The passenger door opens and a boy stumbles out in black and white and my vision is complete. He is probably 19 or 20. He is boy, but I don't know that yet. The boy is stumbling in the middle of the street, rubbing his head. He's pale and tall, maybe six feet, and his hair is dark and longish, An elderly woman has opened her front door on the opposite side of the road. I watch him stagger back towards the fiesta. He tugs gently at the passenger door and the door falls off. The woman in the doorway yells, Is that your car, young man? I'm calling the police. He stumbles up the road in chunky black lace-up docks. I'm thinking maybe he's drunk or on drugs or something and I should probably just cycle away. But he's walking towards me, and I can't move. Give me your bike, he shouts from 50 yards down the road. And I'm like, nah, mate. And suddenly I can feel my fingertips throbbing with my own rapid heartbeat. Behind him, his fucked up car is billowing black smoke into the sky. He's got a smirk on him like he doesn't give a shit about anyone or anything in the whole world. And he has these brown eyes which are almond-shaped and shiny. His face is scratched up from the crash and on one side there is a layer of grit embedded into his cheek. The boy is now directly in front of me, blocking my way forward. He stops and pulls a tooth out of his mouth. He winces as he does it. Who pulls their own teeth out? It's very hardcore, I have to admit. I'm impressed by it. I say to him, is that supposed to scare me? He says, no, sorry. I think I hit my mouth on the steering wheel. Then he says, give me your bike. Are you having a laugh? No. The woman who was shouting now has an old-style Kodak camera and she's taking pictures of the car like she's a forensic scientist. She shouts, Stay there, please. The police are on their way. He takes one long step towards me, grabs the handlebars and says, Give me your bike. I say, What are you going to do if I don't? Hit me? He smiles a bloody grin. 
I pull my leg over the saddle and step off. And he's all like, thanks, babe. And that's it. That's the meet cute. It's Gene Kelly jumping into Debbie Reynolds' car and singing in the rain. Except he's jumping onto my bike, not into my car, and he's stealing it, not hitching a ride. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Careless by Kirsty Capes. Episode 2. Read by Abby Andrews. Bess looks back at the beginnings of her relationship with Boy, when he seemed to be the knight in shining armour she needed. My two life choices are either to do really, really well at school so I can get out of Shepperton as quickly as possible and study film in London, or become one of the locals in the crossroads who drink so much that all their teeth have fallen out. I could go either way right now. It's not until the day of the Shepperton Fair that I see him again. Ishal and I have found an empty picnic bench next to a burger stand and we sit down. I buy two cheeseburgers and a can of Coke to share between us. Ishal asks me whether the meat is halal and I start to laugh, but then I realise she's being serious. Ishal sets her burger down in front of her and watches me eat. Sorry, I say, my mouth full of cow meat. I forgot. You're a she, friend, she says, and I think, hope, she's joking. Ishal spots something over my shoulder and I glance behind me. Ishal's older brother Anwar is striding towards us, his eyes narrowed and his mouth turned down, which is a shame because Anwar is pretty buff looking when he's not angry. I say, hi Anwar, are you enjoying the fair? How's uni? Anwar glances at me. He says, I hope that's a veggie burger. He means the cheeseburger Ish shoved off the table onto the ground when she spotted Anwar coming. I say, how's your mum, Anwar? How's your fiancé? Shut up, Bess. Ishal, what are you playing at? Well, I didn't eat any of it, if that's what you're asking. Anwar mutters something in Bengali under his breath and grabs Ishal's arm. Honestly, Ish, what's wrong with you? He looks at me like he's asking me the same question. He hauls Ishal up and, ignoring her protests, marches her back towards the road. I begin to wander back home. On the other side of the war memorial, a familiar flash of red catches my eye. I look over and see my bike leaning casually against the fence. It looks like my bike. I cross the road to get a better look. Yep. The yellow Apollo logo across the frame is all scratched up. The bike is chained to a road sign. I can't believe it. He steals my bike and then has the cheek to lock it up. Because God forbid someone steals your already stolen property. I can't see him anywhere. I remember his face so clearly. A square jaw with a dusting of stubble. Big black eyes with thick eyelashes. The kind of guy who steals your bike and you don't even mind. Should I just wait here until he comes back and confront him? I'm about to test the lock, mortified to see he's scratched the initials BM into the frame. Who does he think he is when I spot the thief bouncing across the road? He walks with long, loping strides. He's looking behind him, so he hasn't seen me yet. I panic. I step over the wall, ringing the flower beds in the pub garden and duck behind a bush. He draws level with me, totally oblivious, and bends over to unlock the bike. I think about this dickhead cycling round on my bike for three weeks while I've been walking everywhere and scuffing my platforms. The thief sits astride the bike and pushes off, in fifth gear. I'm thinking, does he even care about what he's doing to the derailleur? Of course he doesn't. It's not his bike. He stole it. From me. I jump out from the bush and make a grab for him. He catches sight of me and a flash of recognition crosses his face. But by then it's too late and I shove him hard 
angry with all my weight. He crashes onto the pavement, crumpled under my bike. What the fuck? he shouts. He lifts the bike off himself and stands up slowly. You stole my bike, I tell him. You let me have it. His response takes me off guard, but I carry on. I'm taking it back now. I pick the bike up off the pavement. I wheel it past him. I want to say something cutting before I make my exit, but I can't think of anything, so I stare at him, gormless, for a moment. I click the gears back into first. What's your name? He splutters. I say, you've got dirt in your eyebrow. He says, I'm boy. I say, that's nice for you. I give him the dirtiest look I can muster, kicking the bike into motion, my feet pumping the pedals in perfect time with my heart pumping loudly in my head. When I see him next, it's the last day of year 10. Ishal and I are mooching out of the gates of Our Lady, an earphone each plugged into my Walkman. Today, it's the temptations. Ain't too proud to beg. I've told Ishal all about Boy and my bike and what happened after she left the fair. She was grounded for a week after Anwar ratted her out for eating beef, even though she didn't. I suddenly think I see Boy as we pass the school bus. I stop walking and stare at him tugging the earbud from Ishal's ear and she turns around to look at me. Is that him? She asks me, once she follows my gaze. He's staring at us, I say. I'm going to kill him. Ishal says that, not me. I grab Ishal's arm. Just leave it, I say. I got my bike back. But it's the principal, Ishal says. Her eyes are fixed on him blowing the stray strands of her hair away from her face and then sucking them back in a pendulum motion, like she's about to go super Saiyan in Dragon Ball Z. Ishal says, He needs some retribution. No, he doesn't. He's not worth our time at all, I say. Let's go. Her pointy witch's chin sticks out. I take her arm again and steer her around to the other side of the school bus. We round the corner and practically slam into Hannah Barrington and her sister, Mary Beth. Mary Beth is smoking a cigarette and leaning lazily on the handles of her toddler's pram. Ishal still hasn't got Mary Beth back for beating her up on the 18th hole of Sunbury Golf Course. Mary Beth is big, though. I say to her, come on. I glance back over to the other side of the road and possibly Boy is still standing there watching us. Mary Beth has spotted us. Hey, Hannah, look who it is, Ishal says to Mary Beth. What are you doing here? Still trying to pass your sats, Mary? I thought you would have got the hint by now. Mary Beth's forehead wrinkles. The hint that you're dumb as shit, Ishal elaborates. Hannah says, go back to Currytown, Ishal. To me, she adds, go back to the cult, demon goth. Ishal's neck is tense. She's imagining how Mary Beth held her arm behind her back until she screamed. Hannah pushes Ishal from the side, slamming her into the bus. The force of it knocks Ishal aside easily and the metallic thud rattles the side of the vehicle. A couple of Year 7s sitting on the bus glance out of the window, their eyes big. Ishal is still pinned against the bus under Hannah's forearm. I say, just leave it out, Hannah! I want to sound aloof and annoyed, but my voice comes out like a squeak. Ishal's eyes are glassy. I try again. Hannah, get off her! Mary Beth interjects. Actually, yeah, Hannah, I don't have time for you to be playing who's the biggest slag with curry breath. Hannah grudgingly releases Ishal and shoves her one more time for good measure. You're a know-it-all bitch, you know that! She screeches at Ishal, almost hysterical, and what I see in her face is hatred, or maybe fear, I'm not sure which. I grab Ishal and yank her away before she goes for Hannah. I repeat our mantra to her as I tug her away, not worth it. One of the Year 7s has gone and blabbed, and now Monsieur Elaine, our French teacher, says loudly, 
Does someone want to tell me what's going on here? Ishal sneers back at Hannah and Mary Beth. Fucking council house scum, she shouts at them. I want to tell her, no, that's too far. But after what they've just said to her, who can blame her? Monsieur Alain starts. Ishal, language, you girls come with me. But we dodge around the side of the bus and sprint out the front gate. The last time someone called home about Ishal getting into fights, her mum grounded her for a whole summer. Ishal crosses the road and strides right up to Boy. Up close, I can tell that it's definitely him. Your boy, right? Ishal demands. I think you owe my friend Bess here a favour. She indicates me with a thumb over her shoulder. He looks up to meet my gaze. Boy says, Come on, I'll give you a lift. I nudge Ishal, indicating that I think that this is a bad idea. Ishal says under her breath, I don't care if he's a psycho. There's no fucking way I'm spending another summer in my bedroom revising and reading aloud to myself from the Quran. So we follow him, and I feel like I can't breathe. And we're now already in his car. A bashed up blue Ford Sierra. Not the car he wrote off at the church, a different one. Ishal sits in the front seat. I sit behind Boy. The whole time we're in the car, he says barely anything, despite Ishal's relentless questioning. Is this your car, or did you steal it like you stole Bess's bike? Did you steal the car you crashed into the church? Do you even have a licence? Are you old enough to have a licence? Boy says that he is 19, and that is the only one of Ishal's questions he answers indirectly. I'm embarrassed by my own surge of disappointment that he's too old to like me. When I get home, Mum has had a call from school already about our altercation with Mary Beth and Hannah. She is going to call Henry about my behaviour. Henry is my social worker. I say, why don't you just fucking deal with it like a normal mother instead of threatening to send me away every time I mess up? She calls Henry anyway and tells him that she can't cope. I open my bedroom window as wide as I can so I can hear her talking on the telephone through the open window downstairs. I hear words like unacceptable and difficult and attitude. Later, when I'm sleeping, she comes upstairs with tea for me. She says sorry for shouting and she's trying to be a good mum. We don't hug. We're not allowed to. It's one of those things they teach you when you're training to be a foster carer. I say sorry for being a moody teenager and I will try to not get in fights. And we both know that it is so much more than this, whatever it is that is going on between us. And now it's later in the summer holidays. Boy and I are on the edge of something, but I don't know what it is yet. I'm in Manor Park, waiting for Ishao to come back from the shops with cigarettes. Ishao finally arrives, and we light one each. Ishao asks me if I have a crush on Boy. She wants me to say no, I can tell. Ish and I have never bothered much with boys. Boy is different from the boys at school, though. I say to her, Whenever I'm alone, I imagine that he's watching me. Whenever I'm somewhere like the high street, I imagine bumping into him. Ishao tells me, I need to sort it out. I know, I know. Also, Ishao says, this guy is 19 years old. As much as you're amazing, hot and cool, there's no way he's going for you. You've only just turned 15. I know, she says. Don't ever let a boy, don't let anyone define you. You should learn yourself first before you learn another person. Don't forget, Bess. Don't let him know you until you know yourself. Who died and made you share? I ask her. I start on at her with a pitchy rendition of Walking in Memphis and she smacks me on the head until I stop. Thank you. 
BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Careless by Kirsty Capes. Episode 3. Continuing the story of how she met Boy, Bess recalls their first road trip and their first kiss. When I do eventually see Boy again, it's because I'm in his supermarket, the Tesco in Sunbury. I'm collecting some film I dropped in to get developed. It's been months since I last saw him. I'm alone because Ishao's grandmother is dead and she's gone to Dhaka for the funeral. In the chocolate aisle, Boy is stacking shelves in a blue shirt. It takes me a moment to realise he works here. He turns to face me and I duck around the corner of the end of the aisle. I follow him around the supermarket for 20 minutes before a security guard approaches me and asks me if I'm planning on buying anything. I pick up a Kinder Egg. And eventually, one day in December when I leave my house for school, he's there on the street sitting on the bonnet of his bashed-up Sierra, smoking a cigarette. Thank God you came. I don't say this, but I think it. I shout at him, What the fuck are you doing here, you creep? He says, I got you a Kinder Egg. You like those, don't you? He knows I stalked him at his job. That I'm the creep, not him. I'll give you a lift to school. We don't go to Our Lady in the end. We end up by the river. It's all very dazed and confused. I smoke boys' cigarettes, and he sits in silence, stripping a blade of sedge grass of its seeds with his fingernails. Eventually I say, Sorry for following you. I didn't mean to, really. He says, It's fine, really. You're a weirdo, though. Do you know that? I say, Yes, I know. Then I say, look at it this way. If you didn't steal my bike, none of this would have happened. He's wearing sunglasses, even though it's December. He stretches back on the grass, and I think about doing the same thing, but I can't because I'm hyper aware of every single move that I make and what he will think of me. A few days later, he rings my house phone at 4pm. Mum answers and says, There is a man asking for you on the phone. I shrug and take the phone to my bedroom and lie on my bed. Boy says, Sup, weirdo. I need you to get gum out of my hair. I'm starting a shift at two. I say, Boy, I've got no clue how to get gum out of hair. Can you at least try? It's right at the back. I can't do it properly by myself. I wonder why he's not asking anyone else to help him. I start to pull on my boots and mum asks me where I'm going. Just to a friend's. Which friend? Ishal is still in Bangladesh, isn't she? A new friend. I drag my bike from behind the bins in the back garden. We end up cutting the gum out. Boy hates that there's a huge chunk of hair missing at the back of his head. It looks uneven, he says. I look like a Furby. I say, fine, and I cut the rest of his hair to the same length as the chewing gum patch. He looks like Shakespeare or something, with an awkward short bob. Boy opens the bathroom cabinet and takes out a set of clippers. Just get rid of it all, he says. You're not serious. I'm deadly serious. When I'm done, he runs his hands over his head. It's a very strange sensation he says. He offers his bald scalp for me to feel. I place my hands on his head and slowly begin to circle the crown. You're right, I say. It's like I can feel your brain through your skull. I slow my hands to a stop. We catch each other's eye at exactly the same time. When Ishao comes home from Bangladesh, I tell her I can't hang out anymore because I have to revise for physics or English, but really, I'm with boy. On the weekends, mum thinks I'm in my bedroom most of the time, but I'm climbing out the window onto the porch roof and shimmying down the drain pipe. No one notices I'm gone. One day, 
Ishal rounds the corner by the park and spots me on the porch roof. What the hell, Bess? What are you playing at? My nan died. I got back three weeks ago and you haven't come round? Where are you even going? I shrug. You're going to boys, she says. Statement, not question. Fine, she says. I'll come with you. Ishal, I say. I'm sorry, all right? She power walks ahead of me, and I trip along behind her. After a while, she slows her pace, and I catch up with her and link my arm in hers, and I say, I'm sorry, again, but this time, sincerely. And she says, I'm worried about you. And I say, I'm worried about me too. When Boy opens the door and sees me, his face grins, all glittery. Then he sees Ishao next to me in the driveway. She pushes past me into the house. Hi, boy, she says. She marches into the kitchen and asks Boy if he has any cigarettes. I'm sorry, I tell him. Ishao looks up at me, bewildered. Why are you sorry? She asks too loudly. Am I embarrassing you? She says. She tells Boy, I'm her bodyguard, okay? I'm her mum. Someone shouts from the hallway, Have you seen Zach's mittens? Boy shouts back. No, try the airing cupboard. Who's that? Ishal asks. My sister, Keris. Cool. We're going out, actually, so you're going to have to shove off soon. We're going to see my dad. Keris comes down the stairs with Zach. Keris is just as skinny as boy, but instead of dark hair, she has a bushy ginger mane encircling her head like a halo. Zach is a chubby two-year-old with exactly the same shade of copper bronze hair. Oh, cool, Keris says. Which one of you is Bess? Ishao points at me. And I'm kind of flattered that Boy thinks enough of me to mention me to his sister. You're the one who did that to my brother's hair? She asks me, gesturing to Boy's bald head. It looks so much better. You guys have to go now, Boy tells us his voice a monotone. What? You're not coming with us to Brighton? Keris asks. We can come, Ishal says loudly. We all squeeze into Boy's bashed up Sierra, which turns out to be Keris's, I realise, as she slides into the driving seat. I sit in the back with Boy and Zach strapped into a baby seat, while Ishal gets in the front passenger seat and asks Keris a million questions. How old are you? I'm 23. How come you guys don't live with your parents? We never knew our mum, and we don't get on with our dad. So why are you going to visit him? Because I want to introduce him to Zach. When we get further out of London and closer to the coast, I look out at the fields with the window rolled down and even lean out and take a couple of pictures with my Pentax. In Brighton, We park on a steep residential road about 200 yards away from the seafront. We walk up the hill, stop at a house with an orange door and Keris buzzes. We climb a dingy, narrow staircase to the first floor. Keris knocks on the door of the flat. When their dad, David, opens the door and the smell of pot leaks onto the landing, I understand immediately why Boy was so nervous about this. David pulls Keris into a sweaty-looking hug and looks at Zach, who's clinging on to her. This the sprog, then? he asks Keris. No, Keris says. This is, and points to Boy, and they both laugh. All right, Boy, the dad says. We all bundle into the flat, and me and Ishao are introduced as our friends. The flat is revolting. Keris sits on the edge of the sofa, holding on to Zach a bit too tightly because the carpet is thick with fag ash and there are empty beer bowls everywhere. How have you been, Dad? Keris asks. Nothing new to report, David answers. You've been busy, clearly. David points at Zach. Clearly I have, Keris replies, beaming. And I realise that she is one of those people who doesn't have a bad bone in her body. This is Zach, she says. Let's have a look at him then, David says, holding out his arms. 
Zack nestles into Keris's neck. He's a bit shy with strangers, Boy says, his lip curling. David looks up, as if only noticing Boy just now. And how is the boy? Still stuck in shelves? Nothing new to report, David, Boy says. Just like you. Just like your father, David agrees. But the way he says it is loaded. Actually, I think we'll go now, don't you, Keris? Says Boy. Keris looks relieved. She says, yeah, okay. Outside, Keris says, I'm sorry, that was a mistake. Boy pulls her into a hug. We walk along the seafront, up to the pier, and Boy buys chips. Zack toddles around on the beach, fascinated by the sea, never looking away, even as he bangs pebbles together in his fat hands. Ishao watches the horizon, with a philosophical look on her face, for a long time before announcing, This is the weirdest day ever, and your dad is a total creep. I follow Boy back up to the edge of the water, and he slides his hand into mine. It's like we are in the piano, waiting for our piano to arrive on the beach, and he is the mum and I am the daughter. The tide throbs against our feet and then pulls away gently, displacing the tiny stones beneath. I tell him, My biological mother tried to kill me when I was a toddler. I've never told anyone that before, I tell him. He says, I'm really sorry, Bess. And I shrug to show him that it's okay. Later, we go to a small pub, a little bit away from the seafront. Keris orders drinks, and Zack falls asleep on Keris' lap. We drink wine, and then I'm following Boy out of the pub, leaving Keris and Ishal behind, and the sea spray is salty in my mouth. We go down the verge towards the sea. I think something needs to happen now. I need to make it happen. So I say, come on, weirdo. I pull off my boots and stand up on the pebbles, waiting for him to do the same. We're going for a swim, I tell him. We sprint into the sea, thrown back by the throb of waves. My dress clings to my body, and I'm not so sure, but I think to myself, for fuck's sake, Bess, you might be in love. Boy is hovering closer to the shore. Come on, I yell at him. He unbuttons his shirt, throws it back onto the beach and wades in with his jeans still on. I step backwards into deeper water, facing him. Eventually, he steps towards me. I stop, treading water now. He says, What? I say, What? He moves closer to me as the waves tug at his middle and then sways away again. And something momentous is about to happen. I can feel it. I'm gasping for breath. I tell him in my head, It's like Titanic. And he laughs aloud like he heard me. And he kisses me. His mouth is warm. And there is salt on his lips. A proper kind of kiss. My first. How do you feel? Don't you feel free? He says, speaking the words into my mouth. And I feel like I'm Leonardo DiCaprio in the film... And I pull away and I look at him and my face is like, is this really happening? And with his face, he's saying, yep, yeah, yes, it is. Boy doesn't say a thing to me on the 90 minute drive home. When I get in the house, mum says, well, are you going to tell me where you've been all night? It's 1am. So all night is an exaggeration. Mum says, Is it a boyfriend? What? No! Of course not. One day, you're going to realise that no boy is worth your future, your education or career. But at the moment, it seems you're happy to be slutting around. I should have known you had it in you. I stand up, my face hot and prickly. 
I know I'm going to cry. Upstairs I throw myself onto the bed and feel the hot tears spill from under my eyelids. Should have known you had it in you. That's code for, I should have known you were born bad. I should never have taken you on. I knew this was coming. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Careless by Kirsty Capes. Episode 4. Read by Abby Andrews. Bess and Boy are getting closer and their relationship deepens. On the Wednesday after our Brighton trip, Henry is waiting for me in the school office when lessons end for the day. The only time I ever see Henry is when I'm in deep shit and mum has called him. Henry is tall and skinny, in his late 20s, fresh off the boat in social worker terms, with neat blondish hair and sometimes the remnants of poorly removed blue or pink nail polish on his fingernails. I have a theory that Henry might be a drag queen in one of those big gay bars in Soho on the weekends. Henry takes me to Café Mocha in the high street. What the hell is going on, Bess? He says. Henry is here to tick his boxes, ones that say I'm not into crime or hard drugs or being bullied or feeling suicidal or anything. I'm such an easy case. Most kids get totally fucked by the system, end up in eight different care homes in as many months and then therapy for behaviour disorders or in jail for robbery or GBH. When I was younger, I always felt like I was the luckiest kid in the system by getting placed with Lisa and Rory, foster parents for life. But sometimes I wonder what it would be like to have a mother who loves you unconditionally, like how Ishal's mum loves her. I'm not saying Lisa doesn't love me. She does, I think even if she doesn't say it, even if she's not allowed to. But there are caveats. I asked Henry once why Mum and Rory don't just adopt me, seeing as it's agreed that I'm never being rehomed. Oh, rehomed, like a dog. And he looked super uncomfortable and said something vague about money. I worked out afterwards that Mum and Rory don't get paid to adopt, but the local council pays foster carers. When I was younger, I didn't understand why they always saved the receipts for food shopping or petrol if we went out somewhere, all the hairdressers, dentists, all that kind of stuff. Took me ages to realise I was being expensed. Henry says, I thought we had an understanding, Bess, pouring two sugar sachets into my big coffee. It's obvious that you're dying to get out of care at your first possible chance. We're not going to move you to a new placement when you're so settled here just because you're bored or angsty. I'm not angsty, I interject. What do you want to do with your life, Bess? I want to get educated, I tell him. I want to make films. I'm going to be the name that you think of when someone says think of a film director. Any film director. That's what I'm going to be. Henry drives me home. I call boy, a knot forming in my stomach. He answers on the third ring, his tone irate. I haven't spoken to him since we snogged in the sea in Brighton. I sort of assumed that he would want to be my boyfriend afterwards, but I'm realising how it was stupid to think that. But still, I'm here calling him, wondering why there's always a part of me screaming, please like me, so needy. What are you doing tonight? I ask him, pathetically. Nothing, but I need to scrape together some cash quickly, so I can't really hang out. What's going on? My dipshit of a boss underpaid me, and now we haven't got enough for rent. How much? Eighty or so. We're already a week late. Bess, I've got to go, but we'll get together soon, okay? He hangs up without waiting for me to respond. 
Upstairs, in my room, I open my desk drawer and take out a photo album. In between the last two pages, there is an envelope full of money that my dead grandmother, Emily, sends from beyond the grave every birthday and Christmas. This is a yearly tradition that's been happening since she died, like some kind of staggered inheritance, and I'm pretty sure she has delegated enough £50 notes to send me for every birthday and Christmas till I retire. After I got taken into care when I was four, I stopped seeing her. Stopped contact is what they call it. And then, when I was seven, she died. My social worker at the time took less than 30 seconds on the phone to give me the news. I count out the notes in the envelope. Altogether, there is £850. I count out two notes, a hundred quid, and slide the rest back into the envelope and the drawer. I cycle to boys and knock. He opens the door, holding Zach, who is crying. I thought I said don't come round. I feel like I'm shrinking. I think I can help you, I tell him. Boy still looks mad, but he moves aside so I can get in. I go to the kitchen and find Keris sitting at the table. I sit down opposite her and place the fifties in front of her like an offering. Where the hell did you get that? Boy says. Keris stares at the money and then at me, her eyes wide with shock. I say, you'll have to pay me back, obviously, just when you have the money. Bess, you have no idea what this means. We were about to get evicted. Boy was just about to sell the TV and the microwave. Where did you get it, though? Boy says again. It's just savings, I say. Keris takes my hand across the table. I nod. It's no trouble, really. Boy picks up the money. I'm going to call Eric. Our landlord, Keris clarifies to me. I'm paying you back as soon as I get paid, he says to me, his eyes boring into mine. Then Eric answers the phone and Boy says, I've got your money. Keris won't stop hugging me and calling me a lifesaver. Later, Keris and Zach go to sleep upstairs and I help Boy plug his TV back into the wall from where he'd boxed it up to sell it. Boy doesn't say anything to me for a long time. I realise, sickeningly, that I've basically paid him to spend time with me. Finally, I say to him, Are you giving me the silent treatment? He doesn't answer immediately, and then he says, I really like you, Bess. I feel like I'm going to throw up all over him. I say, I like you too. He says, I think you are sweet and funny, and kind and thoughtful. I say, same. High five? We high five. (laughs) And then he kisses me again, hesitant at first, like in Brighton, and then harder, properly. After that, that's it. I can't stop thinking about him. I see him every night after school and all day on the weekends. Sometimes we hang out in his room and sometimes he drives us to high up places so we can see far away and make up stories about the people who live in the tiny patchwork houses in a haze of pollution and pylons. I steal one of his jumpers and wear it under my blazer to school every day until a teacher confiscates it. Ishao kicks me under the table. Is that boys? So you guys a thing now? Yeah, we're a thing. Ishal frowns at me and mimes puking. Sometimes I catch myself touching my own face softly. I ask him, am I your girlfriend now? He says, come on, Bess. What are we, 12? I tell Boy almost, almost everything. We wrap his duvet around us and our legs tangle together and we are so close that his breath warms my face. He says, Are you a virgin? And I reply, Of course not. 
but I'm lying. Every time I see him, things get more and more intense. And now we are in boy's bedroom, and he is lying on top of me. You okay? Yeah. I wonder if there's something wrong with me. He takes his hand out of my underwear and unpops the button of my jeans. As he pulls them down, I help him by wriggling my legs out of the fabric. He positions his body over mine, and I think, wow, this is really happening, isn't it? I thought I was going to die a virgin. I watch the ceiling. I feel him press into me. No, against me. I wait. Boy is breathing heavily. I say, shall I go on top? I feel like that is something people who have sex say. Boy lies on his back, and I get on top of him, straddling him. Boy is looking at me expectantly, and suddenly I want to cry. He says, are you sure you've done this before? I'm like, of course. I dismount and lie down on my back next to Boy. This is so stupid. Boy reaches for the remote and switches on his TV. I take his cue that our sex is over. I feel horribly ashamed. I close my eyes and pretend I'm falling asleep. It gets darker. When Boy shakes me awake, it is totally black. He is whispering my name. In the darkness, his mouth finds mine, and we are kissing. He says, I'm so sorry about earlier. I say, it's okay. He kisses me again. I say, just so you know, I was lying. I'm a virgin. Boy says, I kind of guessed. I put my head on his chest and listen to his heartbeat. He says, just so you know, I've only done this like twice before, so I'm not exactly an expert either. I say, come here. And he does. After the first few times, it gets easier, like we've worked out how our bodies fit together. On the fourth time, I come, and after, I can't stop looking at him. He says, what? Just that I understand now, why everyone talks about how good sex is. He grins at me, his eyes black and glittering in the darkness of his bedroom. I tell Henry about Boy, because I can't not tell anyone. Isha won't talk to me anymore, because I've flaked on her too many times. I'll call her and make it up. When I tell Henry about Boy, he's pleased for me. Look at Bess, all grown up with a boyfriend. We are in Mango Cafe, eating Thai green curry on a Friday after school. So, how old is he? Don't freak out, all right? He's older. How much older? He's 19, right? But he's a young 19, OK? And I'm an old 15. Henry says, for fuck's sake, Bess. Of course, he tells Mum and Rory. Mum freaks out and shouts for a long, long time. I am grounded all summer and I am not to see Boy anymore. Not that they even know his name. But Mum did say that Boy, which is alarmingly close to the real thing. When I get to Boy's, I tell him about Henry and Mum and Rory. They think you're a pervert, I tell him expecting him to laugh, but he doesn't. Mum's all about pressing charges. I want to tell them, it's boy, he's harmless. But of course, I can't. A few weeks later, I'm in bed, and he knocks on my window. It scares the shit out of me, and I have to stop myself from yelping out loud. He's crouched low on the porch roof. He looks like a cat burglar with a brown beanie pulled low over his eyebrows. I push the window open and shush him as he climbs in. What the fuck are you doing? I shout whisper at him. 
I wanted to see you. What? Why? And he pushes me onto the bed. And I understand what he means. He wants to have sex. So we get wrapped up in my duvet and we are quiet and gentle with each other so as to not wake anyone. And it's actually quite beautiful and my heart is singing. And afterwards I say, I thought you were going off for me anyway. He doesn't answer immediately. He's going through my drawers, my wardrobe, my bookshelf, pulling stuff out, amused at the things I keep in my bedroom, the things that I believe to be precious. What made you think that? He's reading one of the birthday cards that my dead grandma Emily left me. He asks me, Is it hard being in foster care? I tell him, At least I've got people looking out for me. He puts the stash of cards back in the drawer and climbs into bed with me. It's cold, but we wrap ourselves around each other. When I wake up again, at three or four in the morning, he's already gone. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Careless by Kirsty Capes, read by Abby Andrews. This is episode five of Careless by Kirsty Capes. Bess and Ishelle try to decide what Bess should do about the baby. After our chemistry exam, after I've told her everything, Ishelle and I are lying on the grass in her back garden. Mrs. Bandari, Ishelle's mum is in the kitchen, so we're keeping our voices low. I say to Ishal, this is the icing on the cake for a broadly speaking shit existence thus far. I let myself imagine the possibility of having a baby. Maybe I can talk Henry into not being a totally useless caseworker for once and see about getting a council flat. If I can get somewhere to live, I can find a job. Maybe I could work in Tesco like boy. Maybe we could move in together. Maybe he would be okay about the whole pregnant thing. I remember that there was a day last year when he made me meet him after work and took me onto the roof of the multi-storey car park and he'd lain out a blanket and a picnic with shitty wine and cocktail sausages and a disposable barbecue and he made us melted chocolate bananas wrapped in char-grilled tinfoil and he let me put my head on his chest, and he gently traced the outline of my lips with his fingers, the lightest of touches, while I told him about the constellations, Ursus Minor and Major, and he said quietly, after a while of just lying there, you really are something, you know that. And he kissed me, long and breathless, and it was so perfect. What are you going to say to him? Ishelle asks me, like she knows what I'm thinking, like always. The truth is, I honestly don't know. He's been so weird and distant lately. The last time I saw him was when he climbed through my window in the middle of the night. And that was weeks ago. Probably that's the time I got pregnant. He hasn't even tried to call me since. I've phoned his house more than once and Keris always picks up and tells me he's not in. The one time he did pick up himself, he said, Sorry, I'm busy, and hung up. It felt like being punched in the back of the head. So unexpectedly painful. I'm going to wait and see, I tell Ishal. Wait and see for what? Wait until you're showing? Wait until you're in labour? Shut up! I say to her. You're making me feel sick. I knew this was going to happen, Bess. I warned you even, didn't I? I said, he's a total waste of space. I bet he's on drugs. I bet he's fucking some other poor girl. Just leave it, please. I can sense that she's exhausted from thinking about it, like me. In the evenings, I watch the six o'clock news with Rory and Clarissa. No one says a word to Mum. 
I try hard, but I can't bring myself to care enough about it, this thing that is happening between us. Maybe the novelty of fostering has finally worn off. I think she's finally sick of me. I sneak out and cycle to Boy's house. I don't know if it's even cool to turn up at his house unannounced, even though I've done it a million times before, but I can sense that things have changed between us. Sorry, I'm busy, dial tone. When I knock, he opens the door. Jeez, about time, stranger, I say to him, trying for casual and unfazed. I push past him into the hallway. I think, if I can just act like nothing has changed, maybe that will make things normal between us. He seems to be playing along. Want a drink? He asks, closing the door behind him and following me into the kitchen. We're alone. No, thank you, I say. What's up? Not much, I reply, thinking, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. He offers me a cigarette from a crumpled packet. I let him light it for me, and it feels romantic. I called you a few times, I say. He rubs at his stubbly head. I haven't heard from you in ages. He shrugs. I'm not obligated to keep in touch with you. What? I think about it for a moment. Picking out the words I want to say carefully, I say, Whatever's going on between us, boy, you're still a shit friend. He says, What do you mean, whatever's going on between us? You know what, I say. I feel angry. Don't fucking pretend you don't know, I tell him, gesturing vaguely at the air between us. I want him to remember the gentleness with which he made little plaits in my hair, running his fingers through them until they unravelled in his hands. But it's all wrong. I stand up to leave. He tells me to wait and stands up with me. He holds out his hands to me. I step forward and let him pull me into a hug. I'm sorry, he says, his voice tickling my ear. I wonder whether the feeling that he can't bear to look at me is in my imagination. I cycle back and stop at the pits. I lean over the wall and watch the sun go down. Down below, in the water, I can see a shopping trolley, its limbs poking out like a skeleton. I need to get out of here. Not just the pits. Not just Shepperton. Like... I need to be rid of this place and everything about it. But now, there's a thing growing inside me and it's going to tie me to this place forever. I think, I need to get it out of me. I need to kill it. I prop my bike up against the wall and climb over to the other side of the railings, sit on the ledge. I look down to the water. It's about 20 feet below me, Maybe if I hit the water really hard, belly flop style. I lean back on my heels and propel myself forward. And then I am in the water. And it's up my nose and in my armpits and soaking into my shoes and my clothes. I hurt all over. I swim long strokes to the surface and break free into the night air. My teeth chattering the rank smell of pits water all around me. I grab onto the trolley to keep myself afloat. A weird whimpering noise is coming from me. And then I drag myself, my clothes leaden, over to the side of the lake. I crawl up onto the bank. I scream, hit myself on both sides of my head. How could I be so stupid? How could I let boy do this to me? I can almost hear Mum going, It's your own fault, Bess. Your own fault for being so careless. Should have known you had it in you. And my thoughts are as follows. That's it. I've had it. I'm getting rid of it. A few days after the pits, Ishan and I sit on the riverbank. 
Ishal has been in the library at Walton, looking on the web for some information about pregnancy. There are a few options available, she tells me. Most of them involve having to tell your parents. Nope, I cut her off. I lean back so I'm staring straight up at the blue sky. Have you ever thought about what it would be like to go into space? I ask Ishal. Don't change the subject, Bess. Listen to me. Do you want to have a baby? I think about what my future will look like if I have a baby now. I wouldn't be able to go to uni. I'd never be able to make films. No one is going to employ an uneducated teenage mum. I would be a walking statistic. Well, Ishal asks me. No, I say. There's no way I'm keeping it. If that's your decision, we need to get cracking. She starts talking about adoption services. No way, I say. I'm not putting it into a system. I think of being four years old and being driven to an unfamiliar house and being left there with a stranger who made me call her mummy, too scared to let Lisa wash me in the bath in case she drowned me. I need to get an abortion, I tell Ishao. I look at the grass, pluck out a daisy, pinch the stem until it's pulverised. There's a clinic in Brixton, Ish says. Or we could do it the old-fashioned way. Coat hanger in the bath, right? After a while, she slips her hand into mine and we sit there like that, together, until the sun goes down. And then I go home. I call Ishao. I want to do it, I say to her. The old-fashioned way. Just us. Tell me what I need to do. Well, I really don't fancy sticking a coat hanger or a crochet hook up your foo-foo, Ishao says. And I say quietly, well, what then? Supposedly, it's quite effective if you just take a super hot bath and drink a bottle of gin. Ish calls me to come over to her house when her parents are out visiting relatives all day and Anwar's gone out with some of his uni mates. Ishal pulls open one of her drawers and takes out a baggy t-shirt with a picture of a dolphin. Put this on if you want. The bath is running and steam vapour rises from the gushing water. I feel my heart rate go up. I dip my foot into the water. Shit! It's hot! I say. I lower my body into the water, gasping at the heat as it envelops me. The temperature is scorching. I struggle for breath. You'll get used to it in a minute, Ishal says. It hurts, I say. I lift an arm out of the water and show her the angry pink colour my skin has turned from the elbow down. Ishal relents and turns the cold tap a fraction to the left. I'm still panting. Ishal takes the bottle of gin off the windowsill. I take three gulps of the gin and cough as it stings its way down my throat. You need to take another drink in five minutes, she tells me. My skin feels like it is covered in tiny blisters. After five minutes, Ishal hands me the bottle and I take another swig. After the third time Ishal hands me the gin bottle, I start to feel woozy. I think I'm getting drunk, I say out loud. Ishal watches me. Fifth, sixth, seventh swig from the bottle. It's been almost an hour. Ishal keeps letting a little water out of the bath and pouring more in, scolding from the tap. I want to lie back and go to sleep in the bath. I inch forward a little so I can get into a more horizontal position but I slip and lose my grip on the sides of the tub and I fall backwards. Something hard hits the back of my head. I think it's the tap. Bess, are you okay? I'm fine, I say, struggling to focus on her face. Bess? Everything is swimming. Ishal is talking about stopping and getting me out of the bath. My skin is raw. She is talking frantically. Maybe we should go to A&E. No, 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 no. Ishal looks frightened. 
Bess, you can't see yourself. You're not well. I point at my stomach, prod it with my fingernails. It's not done, I say. I can feel it. We need to get it out. I drink and drink and drink. Ishao makes a noise like she is disgusted. Bess! Bess, you've been sick. We need to get you out now, OK? I look down at myself and see that the dolphin on the front of Ishao's T-shirt is now covered in putrid yellow stomach acid. I apologise to Ishao. It's fine, she says. Please stop crying. Ishao pulls me up by the shoulders, but I can't get up. I'm too heavy. She is worrying that I'm going to drown. I am crying, sobbing noisily, ugly, ugly crying. I am such a mess. I am so devoid of hope. I'm going to die in this bathtub. I know it. I can feel it. Ishal is crying too now, still trying to drag me out of the bath. I'm throwing up again. Ishal is shouting even louder now, but she is a mile away. My eyelids are heavy. The tug of sleep is harder and harder to resist. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. This is episode six of an abridged version of Careless by Kirsty Capes, read by Abby Andrews. 15-year-old Bess is pregnant, and she and her best friend Ishal have attempted to end her pregnancy at home, with disastrous results. I dream that I have gone to heaven and everything is light. And there she is, my mother. And she is saying, are you hurting yourself? Are you hurting yourself again? When I wake up, the first thing I see is a machine with blue and red lights on it. And coming off the machine is a thin, clear tube. And the tube connects to me and there is a clear liquid in it being slowly syringed into my body through a needle sticking out of a bit of yellow plastic attached to my wrist. So I guess I went to the doctors like I was supposed to and had a real abortion. I look over to my left and see Mrs Bandari, of all people, sitting in a visitor's chair. I feel my own body, my dry, scratchy throat, my pounding head, my aching bones. My abdomen is sore from retching. I remember the bathtub and being dragged out of it by Ishao. Bits of paramedic green, bits of an ambulance ride. Where's Ishao? I ask, and my voice is sandpaper in my throat. Mrs Bandari looks up, suddenly alert when she hears my voice. Mrs Bandari says, Ishal told us everything, the doctors and me. You're in a lot of trouble, young lady. Ishal too. I feel shame wash over me, tears pricking at the corners of my eyes. Mrs Bandari, I start, but she holds a hand up to stop me. And in my house too. Do you understand how that makes us feel, Bess? We treat you like one of our own. I'm so sorry, I say quietly. Don't, she says, and her voice is wobbly. Humiliation settles over me thick and sour. She says quietly, I pray to God that that baby is still alive inside you. I cry and Mrs Bandari relents and strokes my hand softly. After a while, the curtain to my cubicle is tugged aside and a tall woman steps in. Isabel Johnson? Yes, I say. Mrs Bandari stands up. We'll wait until your parents get here, she says, and then we're leaving. 
the tall woman perches on the chair and smooths her hands over her grey skirt. Isabel, my name is Dr Jacobs. My colleague has already spoken to your friend Ishal. We've pumped the alcohol out of your stomach today. You're very lucky that your friend had the sense to call an ambulance. Otherwise, it's possible that you could have died. I think to myself how easy everything would be if that had actually happened. We have dressed the second-degree thermal burns you've sustained as a result of coming into contact with scalding water. We're giving you intravenous antibiotics and codeine to deal with the pain, she says. I want to talk to you now about your pregnancy. I don't move. Isabel, were your actions today, the bath and the drink, an effort to abort your pregnancy? Of course. She already knows the answer to this. I nod slowly, my eyes still shut. Are you going to tell my parents? I ask her. We have no legal obligation to share any details with your parents or guardians, Dr Jacobs says. If you like, I can be here to mediate when your foster parents arrive. How about that? I say, yes. Isabel... I would strongly advise that you do tell them. This is a very difficult thing to be going through for any woman, let alone a 15-year-old girl. The best possible help you can get is at home. I let out a fake laugh and say, you obviously don't know my mother. You would be surprised, Isabel. It's Bess, I tell her. She tugs the curtain back open and exits my little cubicle. A nurse pulls back the curtain. Hello, Miss Johnson, she says, in a Maria from the Sound of Music type voice. I'm going to just do a quick scan of your belly, all right? OK, I say. She has just finished and left my cubicle when I hear my mother's voice. I was looking for my daughter, Bess Johnson. I realise that I'm afraid. She finally arrives at my cubicle ripping the curtain open. Oh my God, Bess, what have you done to yourself? Rory walks in behind Mum and pulls the curtain closed gently. Me and Ish were drinking, I say. Jesus, Bess. And I drank a bit too much and I ran a bath, but it was too hot, so I burnt myself. The curtain twitches again and Mrs Bandari half steps in. Behind her is Ishao. She's been crying, I can tell. Good, you're here, Mrs Bandari says to my parents. Nazrin, what on earth is going on? Mum asks her, slightly too aggressively. Your daughter is pregnant, Mrs Bandari says. And she and Ishal thought it would be a good idea to try a do-it-yourself abortion in my house. Lisa just stares at Mrs Bandari for a moment. And then she says very quietly, And where the hell were you while this was going on? Mrs Bandari blinks. Excuse me? And Mum's voice raises an octave. I said, Where the bloody hell were you? As Mrs Bandari speaks, her voice is dripping with venom. And she says, I think you're missing the point here, Lisa. Have you stopped to think why Bess would rather give herself alcohol poisoning and near enough melt her own skin off than ask for your help? Think about that before you ask me where I was while your daughter was trying to abort a baby in my bathtub. Get out, Lisa spits out, and keep your daughter away from mine. We were just leaving. Mrs Bandari replies. And then she's gone, dragging Ishao out by the arm too. How long has this been going on for? Rory asks in a low voice, clearing his throat. How long have I been pregnant? Or how long was I in the bathtub? How long have I been an alcoholic? How long have I been sexually active? Best for crying out loud! Sorry, shouldn't joke about it. 
I'm not really an alcoholic. We're going to have to ring Henry. Oh, God, yes, Henry, I say. Social services will want to know all the intimate details for my file. As if on cue, Dr Jacobs sidles back into my cubicle. Ah, hi again, Isabel. It's Bess, I say, at the exact same time as Mum does. Sorry, Bess. I wanted to discuss your treatment for when you go home in a few days. Burns are particularly difficult to manage. We can manage the burns, Mum says dismissively. What we need to know more about is how the hell my daughter came to be pregnant. Dr Jacob steps back out into the ward momentarily before returning with a wheelchair. Bess, why don't you hop into the wheelchair and we can have this discussion somewhere more private? Dr Jacobs pushes me out of the cubicle and lets us into a room marked bereavement. Dr Jacobs says, It's quite clear to me that Bess is very young and not at all equipped to deal with this pregnancy nor the possibility of motherhood on her own. She's got us, Mum snaps. There are several options open to Bess at this stage, Dr Jacobs says. Now, Bess, I've taken a look at the ultrasounds we conducted earlier and the foetus is perfectly healthy. Mum claps her hands involuntarily. You mean to say that after all I did today, it's fine? Absolutely, Dr Jacobs says. I swallow vomit down. I glance around the room. It's dimly lit with terracotta-coloured walls and a potted plant on the windowsill. Is this where you tell people their relatives have died? I ask Dr Jacobs. Yes, it is. Why do you ask? I just thought that maybe you were going to tell me I killed it. There is a moment of silence as the three of them process what I have said. Do you mean you thought you had successfully aborted your pregnancy? Dr Jacobs asks me. I nod, yes. Is that what you wanted, Bess? I nod again, and hot tears are streaking lines down my cheeks. What am I going to do? I ask her. Ask them all. Mum and Rory come and visit me every evening at seven o'clock. We are all avoiding the subject of the pregnancy. I wonder whether she's thankful that it was me and not Clarissa who got into trouble. Clarissa hasn't come. I guess Mum and Rory think she's too young to understand. But she does. She's 11. She knows what pregnancy is. Henry turned up too. He gave me a look like I was a wounded sparrow. Now we are sitting in Dr Jacob's office. My three choices are what Ishal already deduced. Have a baby and raise it. Have a baby and give it up for adoption. Or have an abortion. I wish that there was a fourth option, which is that none of this ever happened. I have to stress the time-sensitive element of all this, Bess, Dr Jacobs says. I know, I say. I know, I know. Henry clears his throat daintily. Bess, I've already spoken to your foster carers, Lisa and Rory. I think he's bricking it that he actually has to do his job for once. He continues, They've both agreed that they're willing to support you through your pregnancy, if that's what you choose, and also with the adoption process. They've also said that if you want to keep the um, baby, they would be willing to provide you with lodgings and support too, and help with childcare if you go to college or start working. It's good to know that there is a support network there for you if you need it, Dr Jacobs says, and I'm sure social services will be keeping an eye on you too, as a young person in care. Can you stop saying care? I tell her. The reason we're all in care is because our parents couldn't care less. And when we're 18, we're dumped by social services anyway, left to fend for ourselves. We're care leavers. Bess, Henry says my name like a warning. No, I say, turning to him. The whole system, it's bullshit. 
I've had enough social workers to know that you're all the same. Don't tell me, I say, breathless, that I have a fucking support network, OK? There is no support network. There is no such thing as care. It's a myth. I can feel my burns searing as I leave Dr Jacob's office. Mum and Rory come to collect me at the end of the week. My first night home, I can't get to sleep. I wander into the bathroom and I look at myself in the mirror. I'm not allowed to get my bandages wet to wash my hair, so it's grossly lank and greasy. I stand in the bath so I can get a better angle on the mirror and pull my T-shirt up to reveal my belly. Dr Jacobs said I was nine weeks pregnant, which is not long at all. Clarissa pushes the door open and sees me standing in the bath. She stares at my belly with her flying saucer eyes. Is it true why Mum and Dad said you were in hospital? I nod. Your hair is really disgusting, Bess. It needs a wash. You don't think I know that? Look. I hold up my arms to show her the bandages. I'll wash it for you if you want. She shrugs like it's the most benign thing. But we both know it's not. I say, okay then. So, she gets towels out of the airing cupboard and makes me lean over the bath. And I can feel myself starting to panic, like she's going to drown me. But she doesn't, of course. She lathers loads of shampoo into my hair, rubbing it right into my skull. And it's so soothing. And while she's rinsing out the suds, she says, You're too young to be pregnant. Well, technically not. Yeah, but you're 15. You're a kid, aren't you? I think about it. Yes, I suppose. Clarissa wraps my head in a towel. I'm all done, she concludes, and she shuffles out of the bathroom. Night, Bess, she says, yawning. Night, Clarissa, I reply. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Careless by Kirsty Capes. Part 7. Read by Abby Andrews. Bess is home from hospital, recovering from her burns, but still pregnant and still unsure what to do. I'm horrendously miserable. Mum rubs a special prescription strength steroid cream with moisturiser onto the places I can't reach. I hate the feeling of her hands on my back and neck. On the Sunday, they let me out of my bedroom and I'm allowed to eat with the family. Such an honour. On Tuesday night, I sit at the dinner table and the four of us eat in silence. Lamb chops and mash, my absolute least favourite dinner. Mum puts her cutlery down halfway through tearing meat off the bone. So, Bess... Have you given any more thought to what you're going to do? Clarissa's eyes dart from my face to Mum's. I look at her, trying to gauge what she wants me to say. I say, I don't know. Because I don't. Mum takes a deep breath. I think you should keep the baby. Rory says, Clarissa, can you take the plates out, please? But she doesn't move. I think you should keep it. Mum says again. Why, though? I ask her. You have a family here who can support you. You'll get help from social services. I can show you how to change nappies and do feeds. You can put college on hold for a few years and go back when the baby starts nursery. I don't reply, swishing a forkful of mash around my mouth. I just think... You need to realise that you are carrying life inside you, Bess. She points at my belly as though I can see it through my skin. 
the little cell cluster all warm and cosy in my womb. Clarissa looks too and asks me if I'm going to get fat. Are you blind? I'm already fat, I tell her. I lift up my t-shirt and push my belly out, showing her. How long until you get really fat? I don't know, Riss. And I'm saying it to Mum too. I don't fucking know, okay? I stand up and leave the room. Where are you going? Mum asks, her voice shrill. Out. Oh no you don't. What are you going to do? Lock me up and throw away the key? Fine, she says. Go out. But don't come crying to me when this all comes crashing down on you. That boy won't care. He doesn't already, does he? I slam the door extra loud. I wander up the road towards the reservoir and think about going to boys, but dismiss the thought almost immediately. I haven't seen boy for weeks. When I get home, I brace myself for the telling off. Mum's quiet. I sit down at the dining room table, facing her back as she cleans the glass on the cabinets. Then she says, If you get rid of the baby, I can't have you in my house. I won't be able to forgive you. I say, Well, that's your prerogative. Fine. She keeps polishing. I said, fine. I say again, louder. Fine what, Bess? Fine, I'll think about the pregnancy. The baby. I think maybe if I do this one thing, it will be okay between us. She stops and turns around. She brings her hand up to her neck. She says, I'm proud of you. And I think she means it. She's never said this to me before. I suddenly feel very flimsy. By the way, she says, someone called Keris rang a few times. Who's Keris? A friend. I hesitate and then say, she's got a baby. He's called Zack. He's two. That's a toddler, not a baby. Whatever. Can I call her? fine. In my bedroom, with the door closed, I dial Boy's landline. Keris picks up on the third ring. It's Bess, I tell her. She gives a big sniff. Keris, what's the matter? It's Boy. He's been arrested. He's in jail. The next morning, Keris picks me up outside my house in a bashed-up Ford Sierra. Zack is in the back, strapped into his car seat. He's got no friends, Keris says, clearly not talking about Zack. I rang his work and the guy I spoke to on the phone didn't know who he was. They're remanding him in custody until his court date. I make a sympathetic noise, but I don't know what remanding in custody actually means. When's the court date? Next month, probably. What did he even do? I ask. You know his car? The one he smashed into the church last year? Well, they finally traced it back to him. That car was stolen. Did you know that? I tell her I'm sorry, but all I can really think about is how my belly is fizzing up because we're on our way to see him. I'm going to see Boy, even if he's in jail. I hope I look pretty. Do you know, I actually think you were good for him. You calmed him down a bit, you know? Then he messed that up as well. I'm sorry to drag you back into all of this, Bess, but you were the only person I can think of he might be happy to see. I wouldn't be so sure, I tell her. Are you in a fight? What happened between you two? Oh, the usual. He stopped talking to me and I took the hint. Are you serious? I'm so sorry... If I'd known, I wouldn't have... Don't worry about it. Keris cringes. What a twat. I laugh, light-heartedly, thinking maybe this being arrested thing is the whole reason he hasn't been in touch with me. I'm going to see Boy. Despite everything, 
I'm excited at the prospect, but I can still feel my hands trembling. We drive to the police station in Staines. When we get there, Keris gives our names and Boy's name to the sergeant sitting behind the desk. I realise that if I go in to see Boy, I'm going to have to tell him that I'm pregnant. And if I tell him, that's it. Keris, do you mind if I wait out here with Zach? Go, I say, shooing her away. She heads through the heavy door that is being held open for her by an officer. Keris arrives back in the reception area 45 minutes later. That was quick, I say, as we traipse down the road to the car park. He is infuriating. Infuriating! I almost got arrested myself. I had to restrain myself from throttling him across the table. Then Keris says, What's going on with you, Bess? I don't answer. It's my 16th birthday today. And for one glorious moment when I open my eyes in the morning, I forget about everything. But then I remember that Ish is away in Dhaka again, that I'm pregnant, that Boy is in jail and hates me and doesn't know about me being pregnant. I've never been so miserable in my life. When I come downstairs, Mum has laid out a pile of gifts on the living room table. You're up early, Rory says to me. He is standing in the kitchen, drinking coffee. It's 11.45, I tell him. Mum said there's a message for you on the answering machine. I go into the living room and pick up the phone, hoping it's finally Ishal back from Bangladesh. But the message is from Henry, my social worker, wishing me a happy birthday. Then he says that he is moving departments and my case has been transferred to a new social worker on the leaving care team. I should have known that Henry wouldn't be my social worker for more than five minutes. Now I have to start all over again with someone new. Clarissa is watching a cooking programme on TV. They're making duck in sticky plum sauce. Clarissa wishes me a happy birthday. Thanks, I say. And as I say it, I vomit all over Mum's tango pink rug that Uncle Jason got her from Amsterdam. I'm sorry. Don't be, Rory says. This rug is crap. She's going to be so mad. No, she isn't. She's at work until 12, so we've got some time to sort this out, all right? After it's all cleared up, I go upstairs and shower, and as I'm combing my wet hair, I hear Mum's voice filling up the hallway. I wander downstairs barefoot, and she catches sight of me. Happy birthday, she says. Thanks. Where's my rug gone? Mum says. There was an accident, I tell her. I was sick. What is wrong with you? I think I'm getting morning sickness. Can you not control yourself? I want to hit her in the face, make her nose bleed. I say to her, would you react like this if Clarissa had done the same thing? No, Bess, because Clarissa would never be stupid enough to get herself pregnant. You raised both of us, Lisa. What's so special about Riss and so defective about me? Both of you, leave it, for Christ's sake, Rory says. And Clarissa pipes up, Yeah, it's Bess's birthday, isn't it? So it's all my fault now, is it? Mum says, her voice wavering. And Rory goes, Lisa. Fine, she says. Fine, fine. Open your presents then, Bess. She pulls out a chair for me at the dining table. I take a seat. Not that you deserve any of it. She says quietly, only to me. And I stand up and say, Fuck this, I'm going. And I leave the dining room and her stupid, smug-turning, shocked face. And I walk out the front door with no shoes on. And I walk down the road towards the kiddie park in the shadow of stage H and squeeze my bum into one of the swings. And I kick my legs and swing so high. I swing for a while, fuming. 
When the sun is at its highest point in the sky, I shuffle home. I tiptoe up to my bedroom. After a while, there's a small knock on my door, and Clarissa comes in, holding the presents. I thought you might want these. She makes a little pile of them near my feet. There's the usual card I get from my real grandmother, with a crisp £50 note inside. I shove the new note into my pencil case, thinking I'll add it to the rest of the cash later. I remember that Boy hasn't paid me back the money I lent him, and there is a familiar pang in my stomach when I think of him. There are seven presents in the pile. I pick each one up and shake it and let Riss guess what it might be before I open it. She guesses slippers, CDs, a portable radio, an ice cream maker, a pair of earrings and chocolate. The first gift I open is from Mum and it's small and squishy. I open it up. It's a set of three pale white baby grows, the kind with little popper buttons on the crotch and the shoulders. Are you going to puke again? Clarissa asks me, looking at my face. I shake my head, try to smile at her. The next one I pick up is a big box with sharp corners. The one Clarissa thought was an ice cream machine. I open it. The picture on the box is a machine with a suction thing at one end. What is it? Clarissa asks. I turn the box around, looking for some writing. Then I find it. It's a breast pump, I say. A what? You were half right. You could say that both an ice cream machine and a breast pump make a dairy product. None of these presents are for you, really, are they? I shake my head. She hands me a smaller, box-shaped item, wrapped in glittery blue paper. This one's from me, she says. I go to shake it, but she stops me. So I peel the paper back carefully, and I see the writing on the box and the corner of the logo, and I know immediately what it is. As if, I shout. I knew you'd like it. I scramble to rip off the rest of the paper and I examine the box, barely daring to believe it. A Canon MV1, one of the smallest and lightest digital camcorders in the world. Clarissa, why are you being so nice to me? I'm always such a cow to you. Well, we're sisters, aren't we? But we're not. Not really, anyway. It feels like we are. I agree with her because I don't want to hurt her feelings. And mum can be a real B-I-T-C-H sometimes. That I can agree with. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Episode 8 of Careless by Kirsty Capes, read by Abby Andrews. Bess is at home with her foster family, unhappy, lonely and confused, but two people in her life offer hope. Later, the same week, I get to meet my new social worker, Henry brings her to the house. I hear Mum open the door for them, their voices filling the hallway. Her voice, the new social worker, is gruff, almost like a man's. Her name is Shelley. I wander downstairs and into the living room, and they all look up at me, and I feel I'm on display. Shelley shakes my hand, all formal. Rory comes in with cups of tea for everyone. Have you had any more thoughts about your pregnancy, Bess? Shelley asks, looking straight at me. I shrug, look at Mum, who is looking at me. I want to say, of course I've been thinking about it, but I'm afraid of what will happen if I get rid of it, scared of what she'll do. But I don't say anything. 
Do you feel as though you're free to make a choice? Are you being influenced by your partner or by anyone else? I look at her and realise she's deadly serious. This is not what I expected at all. Every time I see Henry, he literally has a checklist of questions on a piece of paper, which he ticks off as I answer. I look up at Mum, who is staring out of the window pointedly. No, I'm not being influenced by anyone, I tell her. And have you spoken to the father yet? Is he in the picture at all? He's not around. She won't even tell us his name, Mum says. That's your decision, Bess. No one needs to know except you, right? I say, right. But I realise she was actually looking at Mum and Rory. Mum nods, her neck all blotchy. I decide that I like Shelley. Shelley says, I read on your case report that you're keen on filmmaking. I say, yes, stunned again that she's bothered to read my files. I looked into the film school you're interested in applying to, but they only do postgraduate courses, I'm afraid. Don't despair just yet, because I've found another one. It's called the Basquiar. I think that's how you pronounce it. The Basquiar School of Arts. It runs a vocational programme in filmmaking. It does the works. You know, editing, directing, sound design, casting, all of it. It sounds perfect for you, Bess. She rummages in her handbag and hands me a prospectus. I hold my breath as I flick through the pages, drinking in the pictures, green screens the latest Mac computers in dimly lit editing studios. I look back up at Shelley, who is watching me. I want to go here, I say. Well, why don't we go and have a look at it first? Mum is asking how I could go to a boarding school when I need to be raising a baby, and Shelley is saying, let's just keep her options open, all right? And Mum says nothing. Her lips a thin line, and I feel like I'm going to get it later, just because of Shelley. And suddenly, she and Henry are halfway out the door. Mum thanking Henry for everything he's done, and blah, blah, blah. And I sidle up to Henry, because it's probably the last time I'll ever see him. And I say, just tell me this one thing. Are you a drag queen, or not? And Henry is like, what? But luckily, no one else heard. And Shelley says, Bess, we'll sort out a date to go to that college. And that's it. They're gone. Upstairs in the evening, when I'm alone, I open my bedside drawer and pull out all of the cards from Emily. I wonder whether I could cover some of the Basquiat tuition with her money. I pull the cards out of the large manila envelope and grope around inside for the second envelope with the money stash in it all the cash from the birthdays and Christmases. All I feel is the smooth brown paper. I tip the envelope upside down and the money is gone. Someone's taken it all. Then I think of Boy, in here weeks ago, going through my stuff. I thought he wanted to know me through the objects I kept in my bedroom. But it wasn't that, was it? It wasn't that at all. On Tuesday night, when we are eating our fish and chips in front of EastEnders, the phone rings and Rory answers it, listens for a moment and says, Please do not call this number again. Of course, it's him. So later, when everyone is asleep, I think of my grandmother and how Boy has stolen from her and my stomach is curdling and I 1471 the number and it's been more than a month since don't fucking pretend you don't know, and someone picks up, and then I hear the voice. And he doesn't even say hello, he just says, Bess? Like his life depends on me being on the other end of the phone. And I say, yes, it's me. And I change my mind about him again. There's no way he would take that money. Just listen to him now. 
He needs me. Where are you? I ask him. I'm at home. I got bailed. I have a court date next month. Oh my God. I doubt they'll give me anything worse than a slap on the wrist in some community service. First offence and all that. Are you sure? Bess, when am I going to see you? Whenever, I say, too quickly. How about now? Now? I ask. Yeah, now. I'll come and pick you up. Okay. Bess, yeah? I, I love you. And I feel like the room is spinning around me because this was the last thing I was expecting him to say and I was so ready to be furious about him stealing the money. And in spite of everything, all my bones are singing and surely he can't have stolen the money because he said he loves me and no one has ever, ever said that to me before and I want to open my mouth and scream with the brilliance of it but I can't. So I just whisper down the phone, I'll see you soon. And I'm throwing on a dress, a short one, smearing my eyes with coal. Then I hear the quiet growl of the car engine and I close my bedroom door behind me and mum is standing there in the corridor in her dressing gown. She says, get back in your room. And I almost do. And then I think of boy waiting in his car outside and I say, no, mum. I push past her to the stairwell. She says, it's him, isn't it? The father. I say to her, he loves me, mum. She says, I can guarantee you he doesn't love a single person except himself. And I walk down the rest of the stairs and I am out the door and in his car. And we're driving off. When we're at boys, he makes me sit at the kitchen table while he finds music to put on the stereo. And then he pulls me onto my feet and into him. And I realise we are dancing. The music is You and Me by Penny and the Quarters. And we sway from side to side around the kitchen table. And he kisses me hard. And then he changes And every time he moves, it has more intention behind it. And I know that this is going where it has always gone before. And I look up at him and he says, Bess, I've missed you so much. And I can't help but think of the baby. And maybe I should tell him. But if I told him, he wouldn't be touching me like this. But then I think how we're not even together. And meekly, I say... I don't think we should, but that doesn't stop his hands or his mouth. And I say it again, louder this time. Boy, I don't think we should. I don't want to, not tonight, pushing against him, but he doesn't stop. I let my body go limp, and he's going, Bess, 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 I love you. I love you. I love you. Saying it into my hair. And I'm sure he thinks he means it. And maybe he does. And I do too. I do. So it's okay. Because this is what people who are in love do. Right? (laughs) And he's pulling me into his bedroom. And I try not to cry through the whole of it. And in my head, we are still in the kitchen, dancing to Penny and the quarters. In the morning, I let myself out. Today is total eclipse day. I wonder if the world is going to end. When I let myself into the house, I shower for what seems like an age. I scrub and scrub and scrub every inch of me, even the bits still tender from burns. Boy didn't ask about them last night when I was naked in his bedroom. I can feel the scream inside me growing. After the shower, I go downstairs and I look around the living room at the photographs on the windowsill. I'm not in any of them. Only Rory, Lisa and Clarissa. I realise that I will never really be a part of their family. I can never tell Mum what has happened. 
I already know what she'll say. That it's my fault. And that's when I let out this awful, silent, gasping sob, like a kettle boiling. A broken siren. And then I take three, four, five deep breaths, and I pick up the landline and dial Ishao's number. My hope's not high at all that she will be the one to answer the phone, but she does. Ish, I shout down the phone, excited. Bess, that you? Of course it is, you numpty. And we arrange to meet at the pits in 20 minutes. I get there before Ish, and I lean my bike against one of the trees and sit down in the shade. The place is super crowded with families all set up with deck chairs and picnic blankets on the banks of the water. Some of them are wearing these weird-looking cardboard sunglasses. When Ish turns up, she sits down next to me, under the tree I picked, and puts her arms around me. What are all these losers doing here? She says, gesturing at the families in their picnic blankets. Eclipse, isn't it? It's supposed to start soon. She asks me what's going on with boy and being pregnant. I'm still pregnant. You're keeping it then? I don't know. I think if I have an abortion, Lisa is going to throw me off the chub tower. You realise that's not a good enough reason to go through with it, yeah? What about boy? Have you told him? I explained to her about boy being arrested and finally about what happened last night. I feel sick while I'm talking. Bess, you know what he did, right? Yeah, he crashed a stolen car into a church. No, thicko, I mean last night. What he did to you. I know what she's getting at, but I don't want to believe that's what boy did. That he could do that, even though it's so obvious, even to me. Ish, please, can we just not think about it? Not today. How about we don't talk about it, all right? She says, pulling me into a hug again. We sit there for a while. And then all the people on the field start whooping and applauding. And I say, I guess this is it. The end of the world. And we look up, even though we don't have the special glasses on. And Ish is like, is that it? And then suddenly the whole world is black. And I swear, I can feel the temperature drop. And we keep watching. And it's like the sun is a halo in the middle of all the darkness. And Ish takes my hand and we look up, 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 up. Until a handful of seconds later, it's all over. And we're still alive. The world didn't end. And suddenly, all the birds are really loud. I turn to Ish and say... Congrats on surviving the end of the world. And she says, you too, sis. And we high five. And I say, I love you, Ish. And she says, I love you too, Bess, you big numpty. It's the second declaration of love in as many days, after a lifetime of none. But this one is the purest, most powerful thing. And it's the only kind of love that matters. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Careless by Kirsty Capes. Read by Abby Andrews. Episode 9. Bess, who is in care, has just turned 16. She's pregnant and scared and struggling to face her future and she takes the brave decision to confront her past. My mother's name is Amanda, and she lives in Sanwell, which is about a six-mile cycle from Shepparton. When I was 12, my social worker at the time, Patricia, gave me her address. She wasn't supposed to, but she said it wasn't healthy for little girls to be denied access to their mothers. I never told anyone about it. 
Amanda lives on a road of little awkward-shaped maisonettes. Number 42. I haven't seen her since I was four years old. And now I'm here. She's lived half an hour away this whole time. I lock my bike to a lamppost and I'm thinking, she's probably not home though, right? I concentrate on breathing to calm myself down. I walk to the door and tap the brass knocker three times and the noise of the knocker is opening a box in my head, one that I closed a long time ago in therapy with a woman called Bridie who smelled like humbugs. I packed all these little things into a box and I tucked them away somewhere they couldn't hurt me, somewhere they couldn't make me hurt myself. The door opens. Amanda, who is my mother, opens the door and stops. She looks older than I remember. Although, I suppose it's been over ten years, so I don't know why I was expecting her to look exactly like her photographs. She's not ginger anymore. There's so much silver streaked through her hair. I can't bring myself to call her mum. She looks at me a moment, perplexed, and then... Isabel? I nod. She says... You'd better come in then, hadn't you? I step into the house, feeling like I'm about to walk into the plot of a horror movie. Jeepers Creepers, or the Amityville Horror, or Carrie. I follow her into the living room and sit down on the sofa, which is covered in that plastic cellophane shit that people deliver sofas in. I ask her, is this a new sofa? It's the first thing I've said to her in ten years. She says, No, I've had this sofa for a long time. I stare at her openly, and she doesn't meet my eyes. She keeps fiddling with this little gold cross around her neck. Did I live here? I ask her, because there are things I remember. She doesn't answer my question. Amanda sets herself on the armchair opposite me on the sofa. Does Meg know you're here? She asks me. She doesn't know that I've had four social workers since Meg. Does your social worker know you're here then? No. What about Lisa? I don't answer at first, picturing Mum's face as I pushed past her to get into Boy's car last night. I say, yeah, she knows. And she's okay with it? I shrug. Try not to think about how Mum would feel if she really did know I was here. While Amanda talks, things are slotting into place in my brain. I say, I'm 16 now, I can do what I want. Well, then, how have you been, Isabel? I say, no one calls me Isabel anymore. She watches me closely. I remember, she says. Meg told me you go by Bess now. I say nothing. Well, if you don't mind, she says, I'll call you Isabel. It's the name on your birth certificate. It's the name I gave you. I think you have no right to call me anything. Her fingers go back to the crucifix on her throat and I have this urge to rip it away from her and run. I say... I'm pregnant. Amanda stares at me for a moment. Oh, my goodness, she says. Do you want money? I don't have any. I splutter. Of course not. How can you even ask that? Why are you here, then? I don't know. I can't... I'm technically not meant to be within a hundred feet of you. I say, I lived here, didn't I? She is quiet. I say, I remember this house, and I've never been more angry in my life. And Amanda is saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'm saying, it was a mistake to come here. She says, no, no, it wasn't. How? I hate you. I think we both knew this, but saying it out loud feels blasphemous. Tears slide down her blotchy old face. I say, I know why I had to go into care.
they told me. I just want to know why you did it. Are you mentally ill? Why didn't you go to prison? Amanda says, I was very ill, but I'm better now. You don't look better to me. Your whole house is covered in fucking plastic. I had postnatal depression. People with postnatal depression don't want to kill their children. Sometimes they do. You know I remember some of it. She has her hands in her hair now, pulling at it too hard. She's pulled some of it out and the strands are knotted up between her knuckles. She says, I was afraid you would. I want to use the bathroom. Amanda's face jerks up. I don't think that's a good idea, Isabel. I don't give a shit what you think and my name isn't Isabel anymore. I push the bathroom door open. Inside, the tiles on the wall haven't changed. Blue with cartoon fish swimming through them. The shower head is new. I picture being underwater in the bath and staring up at a different shower head, trying to reach for it. I step into the bath and sit down on the cold porcelain. I lean back and watch the tiles with their dancing cartoon fish. I think about the thing that is growing in my belly. I imagine it as a newborn baby. I imagine it as a toddler. I imagine it as a little girl. I imagine running this bath to the brim and holding the girl under the water while fish dance around us. I stay there in the bath until she comes in and tells me to get out. She's screaming at me, get out, get out, get out, pushing me out the door with forceful hands even though I'm already going. The places she touches on my body cringe away from her. She slams the door behind me. When I slip my key into the lock, Mum comes into the hallway in her dressing gown. I say, I'm sorry for running off like that. She says, I know. I'm sorry for shouting. I've been too hard on you. I go to sit in the living room. Mum sits down next to me. She says, Shelley explained a few things to me about the help that would be available to us financially when you have the baby. You could do a part-time course locally and still get a degree. I nod. Yes, I could do that. And I'm thinking, when you have the baby and the help that would be available to us financially. We're all here to help you, Bess. You are so loved and this baby will be loved too. I know it doesn't feel like it sometimes, but it's true. I know, I say. But the love Lisa is talking about, it's not an unconditional love. It's a love that's based on the help that would be available to us financially. That's the bit that sticks in my throat. Mum smiles deeply and puts her left palm flat against my stomach. I want to squirm away because I'm still thinking about what she said, but I resist. Just think, Mum says. A baby here. Mum puts me to bed like I'm a little kid again. We'll be okay, Mum says. I nod, almost robotic now. I check my clock. It's nearly 1am. I think if this is happening, I need to tell Boy. I creep out onto the landing and take the phone into my room, dialing Boy's number as I do so. Mortified, I realise there's a free son of excitement running through me at the thought of speaking to him. What's wrong with me? Keris picks up on the third ring. Hi, it's Bess, I say. Is Boy in, Keris? I'll check for you. There are muffled voices. Then Keris says, I'm sorry, Bess, he's not in right now. I pause. I think of last night about what happened and in that moment I hate him I say Keris I am fucking pregnant with your fucking brother's child so can you please put him on the sodding phone 
Keris says, Sorry, Bess, and hangs up. I wake up late and I feel sick. I dash to the bathroom, scraping my foot against a screw in the corner of the skirting, and I'm sick in the toilet. As I flush it down, I look at my foot, which is bleeding, and see there is a deep gash across the top. I go into the cupboard on the landing and get the first aid kit out. Clarissa comes out of her bedroom and says, Let me wrap it up for you. And she winds gauze around my foot. Are you having the baby then? Riss asks me. Well, it's been decided, hasn't it? Bess, why are you leaving it up to someone else to decide? That's so, so stupid. You're having the baby because that's what mum wants, not you. And what exactly would you do in my situation? I spit back at her. Well, not that it would ever happen to me, but I wouldn't let her tell me what to do. I look at her and wonder what it would be like to be her, to be the real daughter, who isn't a commodity to anyone. I feel suddenly horrible for being jealous. It's not like she asked to be the favourite. She looks down at my foot, where the blood is slowly soaking into the bandage. Maybe you should go to the doctors, she says. We hear the door go, meaning Mum and Rory have come back from wherever they went. Riss goes downstairs and I hear her shout to me, Bess, come and look at this stuff. So I come downstairs and we watch as Mum and Rory bring in a flat pack piece of furniture wrapped in clear cellophane. It's a baby's cot. Rory props it against the wall as Mum goes back to the car and retrieves several bulging mother care bags from the boot. What is this? I say. Well, we need gear, don't we? Mum says, beaming, and then, Oh, my God, what have you done to your foot? And I look back up at Clarissa. I say, Yeah, Riss, I think I do need to go to the doctor's. And when I see the doctor, he says, So, Isabel, shall we take a look at your foot? My foot will need looking at too, I tell him. And I say to him, I need an abortion. In five days' time, I'm going to take the train to a clinic in Brixton. The doctor said that as I'm 16, the NHS won't tell anyone, not even social services or my foster parents, what I'm doing. I wish I'd known that earlier. Me and Ish talk on the phone in whispers in the middle of the night because Mum still doesn't want us speaking to each other. I tell Ishal that I'm not supposed to get the train home on my own. I say, like, I might be vomiting and stuff. I could ask Keris. Ish thinks about it. It's not a bad idea, she says, but didn't you mouth off at her about Boy? She's doing Boy a favour as well. That's a bit dark. True though, isn't it? And anyway, I'm pretty sure Boy robbed my grandmother's money out of my bedroom. What? Bess, that's so fucked up. I've got no proof, but, you know, it's boy. Yeah. Bess, I know now isn't the time for I told you so. Oh, don't worry. I'm done with him. And I think, even saying his name out loud makes me feel like I want to punch something. I'm thinking that even now Keris must have told him. Even now he knows I'm pregnant. He still hasn't called me. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Careless by Kirsty Capes. Read by Abby Andrews. In this final episode of Careless by Kirsty Capes, Bess makes up her mind and starts looking to the future. When Keris picks me up in the car on Wednesday at midday, Ishal is in the back seat. She holds my hand and I'm so grateful. Yesterday, 
The nurse explained to me what the medical abortion involves, gave me a tablet and told me to return the next afternoon. It feels so different today than it did yesterday, when I went up to the clinic by myself on the train, chain smoked on the way back, my stomach turning, until a sad man asked me to either stop or move carriage because his wife was dying of lung cancer and he couldn't bear to watch me. I went straight to my bedroom when I got home. I lay in my bed, thinking, almost made it, almost there, feeling strongly that at any moment I was about to break apart. But today, with Ishao and Keris here, it doesn't feel so bad. Inside the clinic, my appointment doesn't take more than five minutes. Ishal and Keris sit outside on the steps and share a cigarette. A doctor checks my form again and hands me a blister pack with two pills. He asks me to take the tablets in front of him and then that's it. I'm done. I can already feel the pills disintegrating into my saliva. I have three sanitary towels stuffed into my knickers. Ishal and Keris are still on the steps waiting for me. All right? I nod and croak out a smile. As we walk to the car, I become aware of a dull pain in my gut, like an echo of being winded, slowly building in my body. And it's fine at first, but it's getting worse until it lances through me and I clutch at my stomach involuntarily, crumpling in on myself. Bess? I'm going to be sick. Even as I'm saying it, the bile is rising in my throat and projecting in a crescent fountain onto the pavement, like some elaborate performance art piece. And I hear Ish say, And that, kids, is why you don't have unprotected sex. Keris drives us home, and I lie across the entire back seat, wishing that the cloying pain in my abdomen didn't exist. I let my eyes drift closed. Every now and again, I feel a hand tuck a strand of hair behind my ear, stroke my forehead. By the time we arrive home, I'm fast asleep on the back seat, a dull pain throbbing in my lower abdomen, my clothes soaked in sweat. Keris shakes me awake. Ishal asks quietly if I want her to come in with me, and I look up, and see that mum is standing at the window watching me. And I say to her, no, don't worry. Mum is in the kitchen, and she sees how I'm hunched over, how I'm pale and shaking, and she says to me, you've done it, haven't you? The look on my face must have told her what she already knows, and she's screaming, and I say to her, I'm sorry, mum, I'm so sorry. But the truth is, I'm not sorry. On the Saturday after the abortion, I go downstairs for the first time. I'm not in pain anymore, but I'm tired constantly. When I go into the living room to get the phone to call Ishao, Mum is in there waiting for me. I go to leave. I don't want to have this conversation yet. But she tells me to wait. How are you feeling? She asks, her voice flat. I'm just tired, Mum, I say. Really fucking tired. You don't need to swear. I'm sorry. But you're not really, though, are you? I look at her and I think, she tried her best. I really believe that. But there's something wrong with being in care, and it's to do with making us into a transaction... I think Lisa loves me. I really do. I love her too, in a way. But it's not right how we're treated like a job. And because I'm trying to be a better, more honest person, especially with her, I say to her, No, I'm not sorry. And now she's crying. I think about putting my arm around her, But it feels so alien and I feel so numbed by all of this. There's no room left in me to be sad with her. She says, I've spoken to Shelley. I've asked her to find another placement for you. You need to start packing your things. I look at her, 
horrified. Another placement. Of course. She says, I did warn you, Bess. I told you what would happen if you went through with this. I've been here over ten years, I tell her. I know. This is my home, my family. She says nothing. And I think this is what conditional love looks like. And evidently, my time is up. I stand up, still numb. I go to the kitchen drawer and take out a roll of black bin bags. And I start packing. It's been six months now since it happened. Shelley picked me up the following week and drove me to a new house in Kingston, not far from the train station. I like it here. I have my own bedroom on the top floor and a bathroom just for me. I like my three housemates, who are all my age or a bit older, all people who've been in care like me. I like the landlady, Rupee. Everyone is in the same situation as me. They call it supported lodgings for transitioning care leavers. Shelley is still my social worker, miraculously, and when she visits, we talk about what I'm going to do next. I've applied to Basquiat to start in the autumn. Shelley told me she was going to support my application for a scholarship at Basquiat, a full free ride, on the basis of being in a vulnerable category. I hate how these institutions put us into categories, vulnerable, at risk, looked after. But if they're going to let me go to film school for free, I can pretend it's not happening. I can't believe I've finally got a social worker who's actually doing her job. Shelley calls it an adventure, makes me talk to her about my feelings, sometimes cooks dinner for all of us care leavers together to make us be social. Shelley says we are all the most resilient people she's ever met. She asked me if I wanted to meet Amanda again, after I told her what happened when I turned up at her house. I told her I didn't want to. I asked Shelley whether she thought I owed Amanda an apology, and she came close to me, her eyes very serious, and said, Bess, you don't owe that woman a single thing. I promise you that. Sometimes I wonder to myself whether there's been a day gone by that I haven't thought about it. I secretly thought that I wanted a girl when I was pregnant, and then I changed my mind after the abortion, because a boy would have an easy life in comparison, especially with my history of mothers, especially with my history as a daughter. Sometimes there are moments when it catches me off guard, and I forget to breathe for a moment, And then the feeling subsides, and I remember that it's only been a few months, but as it's got further away in time, it feels further away in distance too. I go back to Shepparton for Clarissa's birthday in April. I try not to go back, unless it's to see her or Ishelle, who has started college. Clarissa hangs out with us sometimes. We're kind of a threesome, Bess, Riss and Ish. I avoid the house, Lisa, Rory, at all costs. I'm not ready to think about my feelings for them. But just Riss is fine. She went off on one at Mum and Rory when she discovered they were kicking me out, screamed at them. How right she was all along about making decisions for myself. I walk to the high street for cigarettes before I meet Riss in the cafe. In the corner shop, I buy my cigarettes and when I turn around... He's standing there. How are you doing? He asks me. We go out onto the pavement on the main road. I let him hug me, compromise with one hand on his shoulder blade, brief, and I take stock of how he's making me feel, checking up on myself, as Shelley calls it, and I'm surprised at how indifferent I am to him. He asks me how I am again, and I tell him, in as little detail as I can manage, about moving away, my plan to go to Basquiat when I've eventually saved up enough money. He says, yeah, 
I always figured you'd end up at film school. You know, education is bullshit, right? I fix him with a look, not biting. Not sure whether he's baiting me or he's just really fucking stupid. (laughs) Maybe both. I ask him what he's doing now, just to be polite, and he says, same old, Tesco and that. He doesn't tell me about the suspended sentence he got, two years, which I heard about from Keris, because we talk from time to time. That she threw him out after he fucked up another car, stolen, and that he has an electric ankle monitor. Seeing you hasn't made me think about, you know, what happened. I wait for him to keep talking, and when he doesn't, I tell him, You've clearly got something to say, boy, so how about you say it? Boy says, why don't we go somewhere? This isn't a good place to talk, is it? He looks sheepish, guilty, ashamed. I turn around and see the car he's pointing to, inviting me into. Another bashed-up Ford. I say to him, I don't mean to be rude, but I'm not going anywhere with you. But you do, he says quickly. You do mean to be rude. And his whole demeanour changes, like he was waiting to snatch something from me to help him reconfigure himself as a victim. I say, you knew I was pregnant, but you still dropped me like it meant nothing to you, like I meant nothing. I can't think of anything else to say, except maybe... I don't blame you, I suppose. I absolve you. I turn away, but he shouts after me. You... you don't blame me. You've got some front, Bess. Let's not forget what you did. I spin round. What exactly did I do? You know. You aborted our child. I flinch. My stomach feels as if it's been punched and all the air has gone out of me. And now I'm fuming, like that kind of acidic anger that sticks in your throat and makes your eyes water and your mouth go dry. I say to him, I sneer at him. I know what you're doing. You're trying to see the bad in me, to stop yourself from seeing the bad in you. But it's okay, boy. Because I see the bad, all of it, in you. You were an adult, right? and I was 15 when we met. You got me pregnant, and worse than that, the last night I spent at your house, you knew I didn't want to, but you went ahead with it anyway. And you think I didn't realise that it was you who robbed 800 quid out of my bedroom? I know who you really are, boy, and the thing is, seeing you now, I just feel sorry for you. And I feel my veins thrumming with fear and power and I'm so desperate to hit him. But I back away, my arms folded, protecting my body. Was that everything you wanted to say? I ask him. And when he says nothing, I say, I'm expecting that money back, boy. I need it for film school. He just watches me as though he's afraid of me too. And I realise that Yeah, he is afraid. Maybe he always was. That evening, Ishao texts me and we walk up to Manor Park and we sit by the river and we are so happy and safe and I know with my whole body that we'll be together forever. We lie in the grass with the daisies, carefree, my hand in hers, and we talk about everything in the world and nothing at all. We talk about how it sometimes feels as though the sky is pressing down on our chests, but we've got some air in our lungs now, and that's all that matters. So we lie very still, our fingers intertwined, and we look up. Careless by Kirsty Capes, was read by Abby Andrews. It was abridged by Katrin Williams and produced by Nicola Holloway. Hold up. 